Hi there, <clears throat> and hello to our final broadcast of 2017. Um, first of all, uh, let me quickly uh, uh, say one thing. Um, I might sound a bit um, broken today <laughs> because my, my throat is, is kind of uh, uh, on, the, on the verge of going sore. So uh, should I uh, suddenly mute everything and uh, uh, look like I'm dying in a coughing fit that might be related to that, but I think I should be fine. So just so you don't wonder what's up with that. Um, everything is fine, I think, mostly. <laughs> All right, so as I said, final broadcast of 2017. Um, welcome to that. It has been uh, uh, an eventful two weeks. <laughs> uh, and um, I don't know about you, but I'm certainly you know, really looking forward to some relaxing time off over the holidays. Um, especially since the second half of 2017 was a bit intense uh, with my yeah with my horrible flu of doom 2017 and uh, especially the last two weeks I'll come to that briefly. Um, so let's get started, I guess. Um, first of all, those of you who are currently watching this live, um, we have a live chat as usual on mobile. That's down there on um, on your desktop. That should be over there. And I'll keep an eye on this. I have it here on my uh, on my left side. Um, so if you have any questions during the Q and A segment that you want to add or anything like that, or or need or want to clarify something, or want you know the usual stuff, um, just feel free to to throw it in there, and I'll try to keep an eye on it and um, get it sorted. So. Um, the outline is the usual one. I'll, I'll first start telling you what I've been up to since our last broadcast, which was roughly a month ago, um, what my next steps will be. Then we have our short Q&A segment. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, then a, and a quick wrap up at the end. So um, what I've been up to. So um, uh, as I mentioned last time, I did a couple of of things or, or for 140, but um, uh, regarding the permission system that I mentioned back then. But um, the most uh, the most work the past month was actually done towards the 136 release, and uh, I think that was worth it because that was released last Tuesday. So just this Tuesday, this is the first weekend with it being out. Um, and uh, yeah, the reason for, for putting it out before Christmas, after all, uh, even though I originally hadn't planned on that, there were a couple of bugs in there, uh, especially with Firefox and such, um, which is currently tr getting a lot more traction after the release of the latest uh, of the latest version of them, which uh, which which is a bit faster and all that again, um, and I felt that it might be a good idea to try to get that out as soon as possible. So I, um, yeah, I I planned on getting it out before Christmas, and um, uh, usually when I when I push releases out, I always try to push them out a bit before the next weekend, so that if something comes up, I still have some time to get stuff fixed in them. Um, before they severely limit people's fun uh, uh, and hobby activities over the weekend. Um, and uh, so the plan was to target this week, basically, uh, so that, yeah, um, from Tuesday until today, yeah, there was a lot of time still to, to, to take care of anything that might have come up, which it didn't. And should anything come up over the weekend, I'll still be here on Monday, so to speak, and take, be able to take a look. Um, the goal, of course, being to have a stable, a really stable rock solid version out over the holidays um, so that everyone who gets a new printer will have some, they will be able to have some fun with it. And yeah, so I, I, I hope this succeeded. So far, it's really looking promising. Um, the reports I so far got again were more issues with uh, configuration problems or uh, corrupted git checkouts or stuff like that and not actual bugs. So that's looking good. Um, yeah, another thing that really cost me a lot of time and that was was what I mentioned earlier with the past two weeks uh, was this whole Patreon fee mess madness that uh, caused a lot of worry uh, on uh, for me for, for, for the future. Of my involvement with Octoprint and it was yeah it was a decidedly unfunny experience and uh, just in case you didn't 
yeah didn't notice what this was all about because uh, now it's thankfully solved again is um well as you know those of you who are watching this live know my my, my full-time work on octoprint is financed mostly through my patreon campaign and on december 7th Dece uh, uh, so so second to last thursday um patreon decided to announce a change in the fee structure and said change would have made pledging on patreon very 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 unattractive to a lot of the small pledge levels so one dollar two dollar three dollars um and what patreon kind of forgot in announcing that change is that small pledges are basically the backbone of most uh, of, of successful uh, patreon campaigns and in a nutshell um yeah a lot of supporters left in droves they pretty much fled the platform um which i by the way found completely understandable because the fee change was simply insane in my eyes um and creators like myself uh yeah lost lots of lots of support in the process and that basically yeah led to a nice shitstorm on twitter and every every single social channel um where patreon is present on and um, after they went uh, completely radio silent for a couple of days, um, they thankfully in the end announced uh, on December 13th. So just a day after I pushed out 136. Uh, I don't think that this is related, but still I found it incredibly funny um, that they would not roll out that change after all and instead uh, work with us creators more closely uh, or or at all maybe you know um to find better solutions to problems that yeah a lot of creators face and which they said they were actually looking into fixing with that fee changes so maybe um yeah maybe this in the long run this will lead to a better platform experience for everyone um maybe it will be the beginning of the end i have no idea <laughs> but uh, currently i'm i'm more optimistic again um this this uh, this roll the rolling back this change i think was the, the definitely the right call and um i i was very pleasantly surprised that they actually did that and um yeah i mean it it, it still was an idiotic change to begin with and the way they announced it with so short before for christmas so short with, with such a short um delay before they were going to enact it so they announced it on the 7th and they were going to uh enact it on the 18th uh there certainly wasn't a good good decision and um yeah they they made me not sleep very well for the for more than a week uh no for for a week so basically yeah for the week that this thing was um this thing was uh, the de facto what was going to happen so before they rolled back but in the end thankfully they did the right thing yeah what what it what what it made me do however was that uh, over this week i looked very heavily into alternatives and other options i also added a libera pay to the list of options on uh, support.octoprint.org uh, to support my work and uh, i'll also look into adding stripe asap um what i also wanted to add was something like paypal subscriptions and then i had to find out that in germany they apparently aren't available unless you get uh, something like 25k euros per month into your paypal account uh, which i'm not seeing happening very soon <laughs> um so yeah so far so so far my uh, so that that uh, the, the alternatives that i came up on such a short notice um therefore were not that many but yeah i'll keep my eyes peeled and uh, there are also a couple of other um services that are um yeah launching soon or already have launched so if something like that happens again and patreon doesn't come to its senses again at least now I have an idea how to handle situations like that. In any case, thanks to everyone who stuck uh, with me and, and also those who left but instead switched immediately over to PayPal or otherwise got in touch with me to continue their support just outside of, of, of Patreon. It really meant a lot to me to know that uh, yeah, you understood my plight in all this because um, yeah, it was a very 
sorry for cursing, but a very shitty situation to f find myself in um, because I, I had no, no influence at all. It was a decision completely made by Patreon and, um, and it, it caught everyone by a complete surprise there. So they, they did send an, an email about this to creators a couple uh, a day, I think 24 hours or so earlier. The, the thing is though, that they sent it in the evening and I didn't see it until the morning of the seventh and didn't find the time to actually read it until yeah, everyone knew it. So yeah, that didn't help a lot either. Um, yeah, but long story short, I'm, I'm going to look forward now. Uh, what is done is done and uh, I'll also get a bit more, I'll also talk a bit more later on that because that was also something that uh, um, was asked for the Q&A section, but um, yeah, um, in any case, I guess you can imagine that uh, that was somewhat intense. Yeah, but now it's thankfully over. <clears throat> Um, so anyhow, uh, after getting 136 out now, what are my next steps? So the first thing first is a Christmas vacation. Um, I'm still not back at 100% after the flu of doom that I mentioned, as you might maybe hear a little, I don't know. Uh, I, I sound different to me right now, but I'm not sure if you can pick that up on the mic. Um, so, so a break is certainly welcome. Uh, right in the middle of that break though, so from uh, December 27th until December 13th, I'll be in Leipzig at the Chaos Communication Congress uh, this year's. So um, yeah, and I even got a flu shot in preparation for that because, you know, with 10 to 12,000 uh, people in one Congress center uh, right around this time of the year, <laughs> you want to be prepared. Um, so should you be there by any chance uh, and happen to run into me, don't be shy because being shy is my job. And uh, yeah, just say hi. Uh, I'll probably also have some stickers with me. So this is one of uh, one, one chance to get them. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, I will be there all four days. And uh, after that, we'll, we'll take a couple more days off and then uh, including New Year's, of course, and then we'll be back at work some time in the second week of January. So at least that's the plan currently. Um, and I hope that works out. Yeah. And once I'm back, then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll look into both 137 and also 140. Again, um, there's a slight bump in the road right now with uh, with the permission stuff on 1.4.0 that needs some clarification first with Salandora. So I'm waiting for that. So what I'll probably do come uh, January is uh, finally take another shot at that com layer refactoring that I've been talking and talking and talking about and never gotten around to do. So wish me luck that this actually will work out. And uh, once we have these, yeah, these, these, uh, yeah, the, the current questions about the permission layer cleared, we uh, permission branch cleared, we will then, I'll then also look into getting that into, um, into one for uh, merged into one for all. Yeah. <clears throat> so that would be the next steps. Um, so that brings us now to the Q and a section. Um, I simply start with the first question. Again, if you are watching this live, feel free to also ask questions in the live chat and if there's still time and all that, then I will uh, also get to them, of course. Um, first question by Sebastian. Can you explain your development environment? For example, which IDE are you using, integrated development environment? How do you manage the list of issues? Your change logs are always impressive and detailed. I suppose that you are not doing this manually. Okay, so with regards to my development environment, um, that might come as a shock to some people. I know it has come as a shock to some people in the past. Uh, I develop under Windows, <laughs> Windows 10, 64 bit. Um, I use uh, PyCharm uh, from JetBrains as my uh, IDE. Uh, JetBrains is that company that also does IntelliJ for those of you uh, um, who, who know that maybe. Um, and actually when I started working on Octoprint now, yeah, now nearly five years ago, I, um, I actually started working on it in IntelliJ with the Python plugin. And then when I went full time, I switched over to PyCharm. 
And uh, yeah, what I really like about this IDE is uh, yeah the refactoring tools, the debugger, everything that just just works for me. I've really gotten used to the workflow in there and um, tailored it to my liking and all that. So I wouldn't want to switch anymore, to be honest. But uh, of course, it's not a necessity to be able to develop on Octoprint. So if you want to help out with anything, don't think that you need a PyCharm license in order to be able to, it, you will be able to edit the source files and do development work just as well with a free um, IDE or something like Atom or um, VS Code or some such, or even Notepad if you are a masochist. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, and what I also use, uh, of course, what is what's yeah, what is one of the quintessential pieces of my development workflow, my development environment, is uh, the Git Bash, and not only for Git, um, but also um, yeah, as my preferred um, command line. Actually, um, I never really got uh, that comfortable with PowerShell so far, and I hate the regular Windows shell. So, yeah. And I just feel at home with Bash. I used to use Linux exclusively for a couple of years uh, uh, in the in the early 2000s, and um, so I I really feel lost when I do not have a Bash uh, uh, at my fingertips in order to quickly run some commands and all that. Um, and I have this sitting in a, a nice little command line tool uh, called uh, uh, not command line tool sorry command line wrapper called Conemu. Um, and that allows me to have uh, to, 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 yeah, it, this basically runs in the background all the time for me. And uh, I have a little shortcut on my on my keyboard that make, brings it down Quake style whenever I hit the shortcut. So I'm really just always one Windows plus circumflex on my keyboard away um, from from a bash. Uh, and Sebastian just asked in the in the live chat, the free or the paid version of PyCharm, actually the paid one. So there's also a community edition. Uh, that is free for, yeah, especially for open source work and all that. It's a bit limited, though, with regards, I think, to the support for the, um, yeah, for the more web-centric bits. So working on Octoprint does not only involve editing Python files, as you as you might know, but also, of course, working on the front-end part. So all that HTML, CSS, uh, less, uh, and JS files and all that. And um, uh, there, that's where we're... Uh, the paid version really shines. Also, I'm. For me, it's it's something like if I was a you know if I was a craftsman or something, uh, working a woodworker or, or someone, I would also pay for my tools for that. So I feel okay with um, having a, a proper license for for the for the paid version. And I also did the same back when I was still a main Java developer. Developer, I, I bought myself my license, my, my, my IntelliJ license, I bought it myself for myself. Uh, that was not something that the company bought for me. Uh, that was my own thing. Yeah. So uh, back to the development environment. Uh, what I also do these days a lot is uh, when I prepare a release or something like that, uh, um, yeah, you, mostly when I prepare releases or release candidates, then I have to, I, what I do is I do a lot of update tests. So I flash various versions of Octopi with various starting states. Uh, uh, so the stock Octoprint version on that or an updated version on that and um, and something, an, an instance that already, already has been run through the first setup wizard and, or something that is completely fresh and all that. And um, test the upgrade path to the version I'm about to put out from that and also from various release branches and all that. And um, to help me a bit with this so do, that I do not forget any initial, initial, uh, initialization steps <laughs> uh, and also to allow me to uh, simulate an active release without it actually being already out for everyone. Uh, yeah, I have to do some stuff and that stuff is something that I use uh, fab files for. So Fabric. Fabric is an, uh, yeah, something like a server automation tool from um, also written in Python. So I have a fab file now that allows me to um, set the Wi-Fi credentials and the host name of a freshly, fla freshly fleshed Octopi image, then um, connects to it once it's booted up uh, and prepares the instance to the state that I want it at and also makes it think that there's an update and where to find 
the files for that update and all that. And this is something that I've yeah, I created a Fabric file for. And then every time that I do update tests, I have a, a bunch of tasks that I can just run instead of having to think of every single step all the time. I cannot fully automate it um, because I still have to push the card out of the card reader and into the pie and all that. I've also looked into using something like netbooting uh, to automate it, automate it better, but haven't gotten around to looking more closely at it so far, but at least it uh, severely decreases the likelihood of me forgetting something. And yeah, I also have a release checklist for, for stuff like that. And to bring me to the second part of the initial question, um, what I have not automated at all actually is the changelog generation. So um, I did look a bit into available tools to compile a changelog from git commits. Um, to see if that would help me at all, at all in any way, but I was not happy at all with the results. So that really didn't feel like it was going to help me um, because for me, co commits simply serve a different purpose than a changelog. Um, I think commits are, are more, yeah, for communicating what change was done, um, why to a developer. So maybe even the same developer a couple of years or months down the road. Uh, but in any case, you, you have a simp so you have, you have a different audience there. You have, um, things, other things that you need to communicate. You are referencing tickets, but you also are referring to technical problems that you encountered and stuff like that. And, uh, this is not something that a lot of people would find helpful in a change log. On the other hand, um, a change log, um, which I think is something that co usually should communicate a bit more of the bigger picture than sim single singular commits do, um, yeah, should give you a bit of a larger perspective of what actually did change in did between two releases and less what individual single changes led up to the bigger change, if that makes any kind of sense. So, um, yeah, I actually do compile my change logs manually. Um, instead, what I do is I, yeah, usually, um, be, when I'm preparing a, re a new release or a new release candidate, I sit down and I go do, through all the tickets first that I had added to the milestone for this upcoming release and, uh, use, use those as a first, uh, yeah, as a first list of features of improvements of bug fixes. And then I go through all of the pull requests that emerged. Uh, for into this, into the current maintenance or development branch and do the same for them and add them to this list. And then I go through the whole git lock, all, all commits since the last release. Um, by then I already know what I have already added to the list because it was for specific tickets or from specific PRs, but everything else that is in there that I, I, I then also try to put into some wording. So a lot of stuff usually ends up in various typo fixes or something like that. But I also during development usually fall all over and fall over bugs or, or come across um, stuff where I think, ah, you know, this is bugging me so long. I'll just quickly fix this now. Uh, or, or, and, 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 and yeah, things like that is, is everything that doesn't have a ticket number in the change log. And this is what I compile myself out of the commits and try to phrase in a way that, yeah, it it makes more sense than, I don't know, refactored this and that manager class, because this is something that no one will have an idea about what, what this means, unless they are familiar with the code. Whereas if you, um, if you read something like, I don't know, um, edit a checkbox to work around this and that firmware box, um, so, sorry, I was just looking at the chat and that actually made me lost my, lose, lose my train of thought. Um, yeah, so basically this is how I do my change log. And um, because it was just asked, uh, I'm not using any, any other tools for, for ticket management than what the GitHub bug tracker offers me. Because I, I look briefly into using, uh, into looking uh, into, yeah, into adding some other systems and synchronize them with GitHub. But uh, the, the thing is, um, having a public bug tracker, while it certainly has it, the downside of producing a lot of duplicates and also a lot of tickets that are not actually bugs, but rather stuff like 
I don't know, my webcam won't work, which is nothing that I can do anything about because Octoprint doesn't use your webcam as well. So support requests or how do I, all this, all this are things that are, that are at the wrong location in the back tracker, but still, even though it produces all those and, 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 and hence a, a certain type of overhead that I have to, um, that I have to keep in mind when managing tickets, um, having a public one helps because, well, if you actually do encounter a bug, chances are now very, very, very much greater that you will actually, um, put them in the right system and I'll be able to uh, quickly get back to you, get information from you and tackle it with you. So, um, no external system, uh, so far looked like it might be better suited to solve this for me because, well, if you look at Jira, Jira is certainly something that is very powerful and the integrated workflows and all that make a lot of stuff very easy for developers. But, um, if you push a regular end user towards that, they will probably be completely lost. I know that I got lost the first times that I encountered Jira. And um, there's already a, a bit of a problem with, with GitHub in that regard. So a lot of, a lot of people, um, yeah, do not read the contribution guidelines because they think opening a ticket is not actually a contribution and stuff like that. So yeah, I don't think that that another ticket system would solve this. And then of course you have uh, stuff like user support uh, tooling and all that, but then you, you have the problem that you have to sync all that with, with GitHub so that if you close something via commit, it will actually close the ticket. And other. so I, after looking, yeah, I, I keep looking at stuff again and again, every couple of months. And so far I haven't found anything where I thought, okay, that might be worth the hassle of, uh, hassle of setting this up and trying to get stuff to work and, 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 and teaching everyone to, uh, to, to use a new workflow also as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, in the end, uh, in any way, um, this whole change log stuff is usually the thing that apart of course from doing the work towards the next release, uh, like fixing bugs, improving stuff, implementing new features and all that. But from the, just from the, the, the pure release tasks, um, this is the second, uh, uh most time consuming task, actually, uh, the, the most time consuming one being the, um, yeah, I think actually being the test the test phase where I do those update tests, because sometimes when I then find something still being broken, I have to, uh, yeah, start again after fixing it. And <laughs> so, yeah, this is, it can be a bit, um, time consuming. And Brad just asked on the live chat, purely dev topics, or can we also discuss a small behavioral annoyance that might be fixable? Um, I guess that refers to what is the bug tracker supposed to be used to, uh, used for. Um, yeah, of course, if you have something like, I don't know, if I push this button, I, I would find it nicer that it did this instead of that, or this on top of that, or something like that. This is also something that makes sense in a bug tracker or rather. So the bug tracker is not only bug tracker, it's also where you should post feature requests, of course, but what the bug tracker is not well suited for is, um, seeking help for how do you install Octopi or how do you get this $3 webcam that you got off of eBay to work with uh, your Octopi image or stuff like that. Um, so this is the, the distinction. So basically as soon as it smells like it is not, not actually something that I can do anything about so that this will be solved for everyone. It's become more of a kind of support situation. If this makes sense, I'm not sure if I'm expressing myself well right now. Um, so if it's something like if it, boil, if, if solving a ticket uh, boils down to me telling you, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Okay, that solved it. Thank you. It will probably be better suited for uh, a mailing list, the mailing list or the, the G plus community or, and this is something I've been working on um, and looking into uh, a dedicated support form. Because the good thing about this is also, it's not just me uh, reading those uh, threads uh, or mails or whatnot then, but there are other people that can help each other. So, um, 
and when you take a look at the uh, at the questions posted to the mailing list or the uh, Google, uh, Google Plus community, um, those keep repeating actually. And uh, at the beginning, I had these kind of questions. Also, um, I allowed them in the back tracker, and the overhead those produced and, and simply the, the ground noise they produced it was it was deafening. So um, yeah, now I I want to keep the bugs the, the bug tracker or rather, let's call it the issue tracker, strictly to bugs, feature requests. And this is also something for which I have a, a category in there that you can put into uh, the ticket label, um, brainstorming. So if you have an idea on how to improve an octoprint uh, and, and want to discuss it or something like that, um, then this is also a good place, but not uh, things like, uh, again, the $3 USB webcam that you got off of eBay. Um, and why it doesn't do what you're expecting it to do or something like that. Because, yeah, this is not something that I actually can solve. So, yeah. All right. I think that apparently fully answers this question. Um, okay, then let's get to the next question by Chris. Would there be any problems running Octoprint from an NFS mount? This way I would be able to use snapshots from my NAS to be able to test things like RCs and be able to roll back if any issues are encountered. So um, first of all, Octoprint doesn't really care what kind of storage it uses or where the storage is installed or where it itself is installed. Um, as long as stuff doesn't change uh, uh, yeah, dynamically while it is expecting it to not change. So if you, for example, um, have your uh, config folder mounted to, on a NAS storage and your network goes down and Octoprint suddenly finds itself without a network, uh, without a configuration file, it will certainly not be happy. But, um, or when you have your upload, fo upload folder stored on the NAS and someone upload something like the, uh, you know, nah, that, that is actually something that Octoprint will be able to cope with, but something starts manipulating the, the metadata YAML file for uploaded files outside of Octoprint's control. That will confuse Octoprint. So, but in general, yeah, you can also just, um, yeah, use, use some network storage or some USB drive or whatever um, for, for, both Octoprint's own data folders as well as Octoprint installation as lo as location. As long as stuff is stable and works and has the right permissions and everything like that, uh, that should be fine. Um, so what what could you what you could certainly do is have uh, I don't know multiple versions of Octoprint on separate uh, NAS locations. Um, on, on, on exports, on, on NFS exports, on a NAS storage, and then just mounting the one or the other, depending on what version you just now want now. Um, but to be honest, I actually do not really see the advantage of doing it that way uh, over just using the built-in release channels for swapping uh, between versions, or rather for swapping between release candidates and stable versions and all that, um, or just doing it manually. I mean, uh, you can uh, also just it, it, it just boils down to, it used to boil down to git pull and then a, a, a Python setup by install. And uh, in the future, if you want to test stable or, or um, RCs, yeah, well, why would you want to test stable? So if you want to run stable or RCs, uh, all you need to actually do is now a pip install and then the release URL of, of the version that you want. So this is really quick. Um, so from my point of view, I don't see the advantage, but maybe I'm just missing something crucial here in doing that via an NFS share. Uh, for me, it just sounds like it adds potential issues. Um, what I do actually is uh, during development, I, I actually do swap between stable maintenance and devil, uh, the branches all the time uh, on my development machine. Um, what's important to note here is then that, of course, you always should um, make sure to install the dependencies when you do that, uh, so that you actually do this Python setup py install or pip install and not just swap the branch and then hope everything will work because, for example, the dependencies on devil are newer versions than on maintenance. So if you swap from one to the other and back and do not update your dependencies, Octoprint simply won't start. Um, also something that you might run into is um, 
yeah, uh, backwards incompat incompatible config migrations. Uh, so for example, this is also something that usually, of course, only happens when you swap from an older to a newer version. Um, this is stuff, so when you go from an older to a newer version, Octopus will migrate your config to a new f format if it needs it, but if you then want to swap from the newer to the older version back, Octopus won't find the config it expects. Um, so far, this has never happened in a way that it would, would produce problems uh, that would actually be serious. It would only be that some setting would, you would need to do some setting again. Um, yeah, and another thing that is also possible, and I think is something that Sebastian even mentioned, I might be confusing things here, but um, you can also just run multiple instances on the same machine and um, behind the same reverse proxy and give each one a separate URL. So you could have something like, I don't know, uh, minus slash uh, octoprint dash stable, minus slash octoprint dash maintenance or something like that. And then depending on which URL you call, you get the, the corresponding version. So yeah, that would also be a possibility. You just have to configure the reverse proxy so that it tells Octoprint that you have it hosted under that subpath. So uh, dash Octoprint maintenance dash Octoprint stable. Um, so that can generate the correct URL URLs to function. Yeah. Okay. Then the next question, again by Sebastian, um, and this is the question that I already hinted at. Uh, following the Patreon mess, can you tell us if you lost many patrons? So at peak, uh, so somewhere around Tuesday, Wednesday, something like that, yeah, Tuesday, I think, I was around 90 Patreon, patrons and uh, 250 US dollars per month lost. Um, and that was only the first wave. So my expectation was that a lot of uh, people didn't even get the initial notification by Patreon that they were changing their fee structure and uh, would only have noticed come January and the next payment run for Octoprint would have run because uh, I have monthly, um, I have this set up to a monthly campaign. And um, that means that stuff gets, uh, gets I'm missing an English word here I'm sorry <laughs> so basically the next payment run would have been January 1st to January the 6th or something they always say it will take something like five to six days um, and then probably a lot more poor people would have noticed and uh, would have left as well and that would have mean meant uh, yeah cold sweat <laughs> um, right now last time I looked which was about an hour ago or so, I was at something like minus 50 patrons around and around $100 per month. So this is not great, of course, but it's also not nothing uh, that that makes me uh, think I cannot longer do this anymore. <laughs> uh, this is actually, yeah, it's it's a it's it's one of the biggest fluctuations in 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 in, in the whole um, campaign's um, lifetime, but still. Yeah, it's okay. So, so a lot of people came back, and I'm very, very happy about that. Um, and also, again, thank you for those of uh, you who who, who know uh, who, who 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 did it. And of course, even more thank you to those of you who never left. Um, and yeah. Um, also, what is important to note, of course, is that of those 50 patrons who are still missing, uh, a lot uh, actually, uh, or, or yeah. I don't know if actually a lot, but some uh, definitely switched over to PayPal. Uh, so just gave me a, a larger donation for the next year, basically, or um, to Libera Pay. Uh, the thing is, uh, it's it's very tricky for me to quantify uh, this because uh, uh, Libera Pay is completely anonymous, so I don't see who is actually uh, backing me there. I just see that someone pledged such and such uh, 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 many euros. Uh, per per week, Libera Pay does it does this mostly per week. I don't know why, but okay. Um, and for PayPal, it's tricky because um, um, lots of people don't write any any message or so, and the emails also differ. So I I don't know actually uh, who uh, or or which of the donations that are received over this time span 
were in compensation for Patreon, uh, apart from a couple which actually wrote in expletive, expletives, Patreon, and, you know. Um, but um, so uh, in a nutshell, it's a bit hard to say what it really did cost me in the end, but it looks like um, it was thankfully not that much. And um, yeah, I pretty much just took it as an opportunity to look into more options to support me in the future or rather to support my work on Octoprint in the future. And uh, I consider this to, yeah, let's just call it something good that came out of all this. And that, of course, and the knowledge that um, you all have my back. So again, thank you. Even if, even if the support platform starts to go nuts, <laughs> you still have my back. This is really, really great and a really good feeling and um, yeah, really helped me a lot through this madness. <laughs> All right. Um, so that brings me to the next question by Tyler. I have a project that would require installing a second method to authenticate with Octoprint. On a scale of one easy to ten insane, is this going to be? So this is a tricky question because, to be honest, I don't understand it. Um, if you are asking to implement an alternative to the normal login, method so so the slash rp slash login endpoint um, that is used there by the ui um, to log in a user using username and password so if you want instead something else uh, replacing that using i don't know tokens or uh, whatever or smart cards or i don't know what um, that could be done by, with a plugin you, you would just need to provide some kind of different rp endpoint in some form to log in instead um, you could even replace this existing login uh, navbar entry using um, uh, yeah using using some plugin mechanisms. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a bit tricky to say how difficult that would be because it depends entirely on what you would want to do there. Um, so it's it's a bit hard for me to quantify without more information. Um, if on the other hand you are asking to implement some kind of alternative user store instead of this built-in one right now which uses a flat file basically that's located in the configuration folder um, e.g. you want something like you want to connect your Octoprint instance to something like LDAP or Active Directory or whatever else you might have or some MySQL database or something like that um, Octoprint, uh, Octoprint's user manager, which is what decides which users are there and uh, also um, is used for authenticating users and trying to and for, and for trying uh, and for not for trying to for actually figuring out what rights a user has um, that can uh, can be configured which which class is used there, but it can also just be overwritten with a plugin. So you can provide your own implementation and that we just need to implement um, stuff like find a user by their user ID or verify a user's name plus password combination and, and stuff like that. So this is fairly, in, in, in theory, fairly easy to do. But again, here as well, it completely it, it depends uh, how, how tricky it actually would be uh, on, on, on what you are planning to do. Um, so yeah, I would need some more information to be able to really uh, answer this uh, question um, in, a, in a meaningful and, 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 and uh, solid way, I think. So also, I don't know if this was what you were asking for in the first place, uh, one of those two options. So if not, mm, sorry, um, just get in touch and <laughs> uh, clarify a bit what you are trying to do, please. Then I might be able to help you. <laughs> All right. Um, now that brings us to the final question from the backlog um, by, oh dear, by Zef9670. <laughs> Will you be working on specific features, plugins or interfacing with the Prusa i3 Mark III expansion port now that you have yours? So those of you who are not following me on Twitter, uh, Joseph Prusa was so nice to send me a Mark III and I was very happy about that because it arrived just in the middle of this whole Patreon mess and gave me something to distract my very fat, fatal, fatally targeted uh, thoughts. Not fatally targeted, I don't know how to say that in English right now. 
basically um whatever it, it helped immensely to distract me it's sitting behind me uh not not that one but i don't know if you can see it you can see the spool um and i haven't actually gotten around to playing a lot with it just yet because i was busy with 136 i merrily just build it up um came to the realization hey it works <laughs> and and then i immediately uh used it to print some christmas presents because the one on the uh, the the Hephaestus, uh, two over there which so far was my workhorse just this week decided to no longer be my workhorse because currently it's uh, for some reason filament is refusing to stick to the bed and i have to figure out what is up there um but so this this came uh, this had a really great timing the mark three not only because of patreon mess and also of course because of course it means nice um new printer um but uh, also because uh, it it solved an actual problem i was having with with my christmas preparations so yay um uh, in any case um yeah well i mean if i if i should run into any inter into any interop Let's try this one more time. If I should run into any interoperability issues, now I have it. Um, yeah, of course, I will look into fixing them within Octoprint's core, as I basically do with any printer model that I get interoperability issues <laughs> reported on or found, find them myself. So it is also stuff that I did in the past for, for other printer, printers that I owned. Um, I know that there is at least one bug uh, actually in the in the current iteration of the Prusa firmware in general um, because I got not only one but two tickets in the last two, three days about this I think um, caused by uh, a problem in, in how the firmware triggers resends because it's missing an OK at the end. This is a bug that I also had in this one at the very beginning. Um, and I think it's something that crept in in some some very very old Marlin versions that both that one behind me and that oh, I'm getting confused here and that one base uh, base their own firmwares on. So uh, yeah, I guess I'll have to push out another pull request before I go into my holidays or at least maybe oh, at least open an issue on the on the bug tracker from them. Um, and well, if I find something that would make using it easier for me in my usual, yeah, workflow, uh, I might also whip up something. Uh, I'm not sure what yet. To be honest, this thing has only once ever been connected to uh, to Octoprint so far because, as I said, I was just completely focused on using it to solve this Christmas present stuff um, once it was working. So um, I just did something that I I think I've been doing in three years and uh, had actually used an SD card um, for printing. I know, I know. A shocking scandal. Um, but yeah, once I actually managed to play around with that a bit, uh, I, I, yeah, if I find something, I will probably, uh, yeah, I might create a plugin or something like that that solves it for me and maybe also for anyone else. Uh, what's important here though is that it is something that I would do in my free time. Work time is dedicated to things useful for the majority, which means mostly core development and also means uh, that I find it harder and harder to justify maintenance on my own plugins. Um, and what I in general don't do is I do not add specific also fe features for specific printer models to Octoprint's core. This is all stuff that has been done to, uh, through through plugins. And the reason for that is simply that I do not want yeah, to come off as biased or something like that. So this is a tool that should work with, uh, with yeah, as many printers as possible equally well. And anything that is, is, is required to make it work better due to some firmware problems or that are not solvable within Octoprint because they that would otherwise cause issues then with other printers um, or uh, things that would improve the workflow or something like that. This is stuff that goes into plugins as a rule of thumb. Uh, the only exception being, uh, I already hinted at that, uh, if there are actually some firmware issues that I can work around in Octoprint um, because they are not that crippling and working around them doesn't cause um, yeah, it doesn't cause significant problems with the general operation, then I try to also do my thing. So 
I try to, to, to work around them in Octoplin and make it easier for the user. Um, so what I did, for example, in the past is um, there are a couple of printers um, that run, uh, that are manufactured by Malian uh, that are rebranded uh, under, under the Monoprice brand. Um, and Malian developed their own firmware, which they claim to be Marlin compatible, but in fact behaves like Repetier. Uh, in some ways, but not in others. And well, what I did in Octoprint after getting one ticket after the next from very disappointed users um, is that I uh, simply now also detect those, uh, those th th this firmware and switch some flags internally that will make it work better. And the same, of course, when I detect Repetier firmware, when I detect RepRap firmware, or when I detect some specific feature flags reported by the firmware or such. So these things I do and I'll do happily, but in general, I try to not overdo it because yeah, well, that just makes maintenance such a mess. Um, in any case, uh, in a nutshell, <laughs> don't expect me now to concentrate exclusively on the Mark III as a target platform. Uh, I didn't do that for any of my other printers either. Um, and it would feel completely unfair. Uh, what uh, what I try to do with Octoprint is make it, as I said, work with as many printers as possible and add more nifty stuff through more specific plugins. And when I do find the time to actually write and or maintain them, then, then I do that. All right. Um, okay, then there was a follow-up question by Zef9670. Uh, I wasn't sure, or not question, but rather Clarification, I wasn't sure if the INZ expansion plug I've offered more communication options. I guess that will come in the comlayer updates or if it's just power and zero pins. So as far as I understand, it's just power and zero pins. So basically, um, Octoprint talking to the, if you have Octoprint on a Pi and attach the Pi's GPIO pins directly to the INZ input, input header, which I, by the way, I also haven't gotten around to try uh, so far. Sorry for that. Uh, the last two uh, last week simply was with 136 was too full and all that. Um, any case, uh, as far as I know, it will power the Pi, it will connect the serial GPIO pins, which by the way, I just got a ticket about that today, you have to tell the Pi to actually use as serial IO GPIO pins and not bind its uh, own uh, its, its own console to them, because the default on your Raspberry Pi is that um, either those GPIO pins are completely disabled or if they are enabled, the, the console runs on them. So if you attach a regular terminal there, you could log in like you do over SSH, but this is not for running a printer over. So you first have to disable this console and you also have to make sure that the GPIO pins are actually enabled and are ideally also uh, using the hardware you are at on the RPI and not the software you are at because on the Pi 3 and on the 0W, you have the Bluetooth module, uh, the integrated one, which uses uh, the dev TTY AMA0 UART, which is a hardware UART, and you also have dev TTYS, I think, which is a software UART, and this one is usually the one that's bound to the GPIO pins, and you do not want that. Um, for reasons of performance and stability and all that, you want to swap this around, probably. So, I, as I said, I haven't tried it yet but my guess is that if you want to get it to work just plugging it in will not be enough to uh to allow octoprint to communicate to your to your mark 3 you actually will have to tell the pi to use those pins and to not uh attach itself to them yeah so i might be able to tell you something come new year uh, I'll, I'll probably not be able to refrain from thinking around with that one a bit uh, over my holidays uh because this is actually stuff that i consider fun um, but uh, yeah, so far I do not have a definitive answer. I'm, it's, it's simply it's simply too new for me as well. But I love this flexible build plate. <laughs> that was really I, I printed a lot of of sorry for the noise. I uh, just hit the microphone. I printed a lot of very flat stuff, and getting that from my um, from my hairspray covered glass bed w w was was a bit tough. I mean, there are tricks to to get this stuff off as well, of course, but with the flexible build plate, it was just lifting it off and then going flop. It's very satisfying, <laughs> really fun. All right. Okay, that was the final question from the backlog. Uh, by the way, if you are a, a patron 
and have access to the question form. Use it, please, uh, for the next Hangout. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you this right now, and I will also do that again on Patreon, because, um, yeah, as I said, this was the last question from the backlog. And uh, we are also pretty much done here from a time perspective. Just let me quickly take a look into the live chat if there was any additional questions. Ah, yeah, uh, from Sebastian, another question, some news about the firmware update or plugin. No, not from my side, sorry. Uh, as I mentioned, too much to do with Core Octoprint. I had someone else uh, tell say that they were interested in maintaining it and I gave them permission and I simply haven't gotten uh, the chance yet to look into this further. I could also give you access. Uh, I remember you were also quite active there and then maybe you can try uh, to handle this with the other guy. I simply, as much as it pains me because um, uh, this is really a nifty plugin, I simply, I don't know where to, to find the time these days with everything else going on. Yeah, so that was that, I think. Okay, so that was the final question from the live chat as well, which brings me to a small wrap up, wrap up, wrap up, <clears throat> tricky word. Um, yeah, uh, all that's left to say, I think, is uh, wishing you happy holidays and a very, very happy new year. I'll make sure to put the recording of this live broadcast also up before I leave into my vacation so that it, uh, yeah, that, that uh, everyone can watch it while I'm gone. Um, next one will be in 2008. I am not entirely sure yet when, uh, so if it will be mid-January or late January. Um, or even maybe early February. It depends a bit on uh, what will happen over the holidays and uh, during my vacation and, and in how many tickets I will drown. <laughs> uh, because they, of course, take president, uh, press it, press it. They don't, they take priority. Uh, sorry, I'm, yeah, it's late. It's not that late, actually, but after the, the past couple of, the past two weeks and uh, the past month also, yeah. Um, Anyhow, once I know the workload from all that, then I will be able to know when I can actually also schedule uh, and, and schedule in the preparation for the next Hangout and also doing it and all that. So we'll get back to you on that after my return. And with that, again, happy holidays and enjoy it. And uh, uh, I hope you, yeah, you have some peaceful, days and some some time for the hobby <laughs> and and all that and uh, i for one i'm looking forward to some time for reading and also gaming i still haven't uh i still haven't uh, freed hyrule from ganon in breath of the wild on my switch <laughs> that got a bit on the back burner thanks to to being sick so long and all that and um until then, until we see each other again in 2018, I guess uh, it's just, yeah, happy printing and until then. Bye.